So we're still waiting for people to join. Um, Consuelo, that's not somebody, it's not. Okay, so we already have some people, uh, attendees uh, joining, but I'm going to first uh, let all of the speakers in. And then I'll just run through a little bit of um, what we're doing. And uh, once everybody's here, uh, uh, once everybody's here, then we'll uh, we'll get going. Um, so yeah, where can you tell me a little bit about yourself and where you're from and why you join? Um, yes, uh, so I live in Barcelona. Right now I'm in Greece delivering trainings on AI ethics. Um, I was previously living in Ireland. I was working on educational technology, uh, doing UX on uh, at Trinity College Dublin. Um, educational technology had many um, ethical applications that we had to deal with in, in UX. And then I also worked on learning technologies with uh, industry. Now, uh, with some former colleagues from Trinity College, we have started an agency called Endure or Endurai, however you want to call it. And I also teach uh, design ethics at the um, uh, Instituto Europeo de Design. Um, I'm at the Barcelona campus. This is based in um, Milan, in Italy, though. Um, so yeah, I have my fingers in a couple of pies. I have kept like a bit the both the academic and the industry side. Um, I think it's it's uh, good for this uh, talk because for this topic because I kind of have like the bird's eye view, not like the very very detailed view, but I I can mm -hmm. speak of the sector as a whole, I guess. Yes, uh, so Stefan is just joining us now. Yeah, I think it's always important to have somebody who sort of bridges the divide and sort of can see how things fit together. So yeah, completely, I think that it's very re relevant. Uh, so Stefan, welcome. Um, sorry for the camera and mic being off. As you know, I need to uh, ensure that during the discussions we don't get interrupted too much. And for that, yeah, the microphone and video is off, but you can always turn it on. So I'm going to set up the live stream. Are, are you joining the conversation, uh, Stefan? I was just wanting to draw, use drop actually because i'll have to leave due to my parental duties a little bit later but uh yeah all right, Curious. All right. uh yeah because yeah so stefan was on the panel as well well you know him from the messages so that's fine mm, so we're still waiting for people to join and while we do I will set up the stream and get all of the links going. So I'm just going to copy the invite link here so that I can also invite people online. Uh, there we go. And we'll see. So how are you doing, Stefan? Thank you. It's been a good day, a good few days. My hair is on the edge already. So I've, yeah. been, I've been up since uh, five in the morning. And uh, now I'm closing out my day. Workshops um, and everything going. You see in my eyes, I'm pretty spent. Yeah. <laughs> well, talking about hair, I feel you. I um, <laughs> I I just did my hair up this morning because I woke up with with hair like this. Um, and I think it's pretty true. The busier you you get, the more your hair gets in the mess. <laughs> hey Xavier, it's so good to see you again. It's been ages. Hello, hello, how is everyone? <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, pretty pretty good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you so, too. 
So uh, Xavier was actually, he's part of um, an ongoing podcast that I have called the Dream Team Roundtable. And yeah, he's he's uh, been discussing sustainable fashion and the role of design. And so I'm very happy that he's joined us here as well. Um, so we do still have a few people who need to join. So I think just to sort of fill in the time, um, Avon has already told me a little bit about himself, but uh, Stefan and Xavier, can you, can you also just introduce yourselves to each other as well? Yeah, Stefan, you can go first, and then I go after you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm an industrial uh, designer and uh, um, mechanical engineer by trade. Uh, by learning actually and then I drifted off uh, into the area of uh, process automation human-centered process automation and in 2013 uh, when I started my own company back then I completely drifted away from physical products only and drifted into the business-to-business -business automation um, on a digital and a physical uh, scale. So I've been working in this interaction area or human machine interaction area for industrial applications where I had clients uh, that were producing things that were milling, grinding, drilling, they had diggers and all those heavy machinery. And these days I'm re-employed again in a company that is in the IT business and now I'm completely digital. So I'm just barely pushing them towards or nudging them towards the physical areas, but main responsibilities of my UX currently are accessibility in digital products or the lack of it, which I've been uh, focusing. And uh, as you, as Javier or Xavier uh, might know, accessibility is a sub area of uh, sustainability. So at least from my understanding, so I think we have a lot to talk about. Yes, indeed. Um, all right, yeah. so sorry about that. I'm interrupting no, because I'm not focusing. No, <laughs> Oh, no problem. I know it already. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's good, Stefan, because it's good to, to know it. Um, I'm having the same background as you, so I'm also an industrial designer. And back in back in Barcelona, I'm originally from Barcelona, and I was working in different design areas, sometimes more in physical context and designing more concept physical products, and then connecting with engineering and what is the process. And then moving to Germany is where was the time where I detached myself from more of the physical elements and still being my core and the things that I like to do is something I think that you cannot put aside. It's, it's, it's your love, let's say like that. Uh, but now I move more into all the digital, all the digital ecosystem. And what is funny is when you see the bridge, what now it stays is called user experience and all this stuff for industrial designers have been kind of our bread and butter on our studies, right? It's like, well, you always think about the user, how the things are going to be used, et cetera. And then, bridging it into a digital world i think they have been quite interesting um, nowadays also like you i'm in an it in an it consultancy and talking about it and and what means digital design and what means experience design instead of using the cliche of user experience and then to talk about these boundaries that, that we have across right and accessibility is one of the topics is one of the stoppers but i think one of the measures topas or one of the major devils is this bias what what design means and what a designer is and it's still being complicated to make understand that the designer can have the power to make the change and that we can drive this change instead of just being one part of the chain just to make something happen so i think we're going to have kind of interesting interesting debate interesting conversation very awesome um, so there is seems to be a little bit of an issue with the with the stream. Uh, I can see it on my phone. So I think some parts on some locations it might be showing, and some locations it might not. LinkedIn has been very iffy um, the the past few weeks. Um, so I'm going to start by just uh, telling a bit of a backstory and uh, greeting everybody online properly. 
usually it takes about five to ten minutes for people to join and that's between that time that we start um and then yeah people also join afterwards we already have um a few people online as well welcome guys uh, in the comments please tell us where you're from and if you'd like to network and have ongoing conversations around this topic please uh, leave your connection links and then we can also network with each other um so we are here today to talk about uh the devil's advocate so during this awareness initiative uh, designed for tomorrow there's been a really big focus on doing good and designing for good um but good is very nuanced because what is good and to sort of dive into the issues of, or, or at least to investigate the issues of good. Um, we've created the Devil's Advocate. And here, you know, my my communication is more to challenge the perceptions and to play the Devil's Advocate and, you know, to see, well, what, what does it look from, uh, what does it look like from the other side? Uh, so Design for Tomorrow is a series of events that I've been working on the past six weeks. Um, it started off as an awareness week, but due to yeah, how rapidly it scaled and the, the, the sort of feedback, um, yeah, it really expanded to six weeks um, from 10 events to just about 60, more or less. Um, and all of that in three months. <laughs> and the events uh, have been since last month on the 21st. Um, so it's a lot of information. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm having a lot of conversations and we'll probably need quite a bit of time to digest it all. And so how it started, um, I have a network called um, uh, Randstad UX. And for this network, we do monthly events. Um, our event in January was a collaboration with uh, Ladies That UX in Amsterdam, and we did an event called Design for Good AI and Ethics. During this event, um, I had to also assemble a panel, and I sent out some communications on the Thursday. By the Tuesday, the panels were filled, but then I had to start turning away people, and they were addressing all of the themes that make up the Design for Tomorrow Awareness Initiative. Um, and that is also when the seed sparked for for this to to get in, in to, to get the ball rolling. Um, so yeah, what we have is tons of events, uh, tons of people designed from different uh, perspectives. We have some um, events with uh, relatively younger people. We have some events with very mature people. As a UX community or the foundation of UX, uh, this the, this this event is open to the entire design industry. But of course, it started in UX, and having the father of UX sort of open on the first day was just, yeah, more than I could ever have asked for. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's far past, and we're in a good place. Um, I think we can start the panel. So. Xavier and Evan and everybody else who's here, uh, welcome and let's jump right into it. So um, shall we shall we discuss the questions or do we just sort of want to go with an, a statement each and then with that statement dive deeper? I think we can go with the questions if either mine and we can find with but you feel more mm -hmm. comfortable. I don't have any any issue as you do, as you like. Yeah. So originally there was one question, and that question was um, if we if we are to design for tomorrow and we are to look at humanity for its true reflection and um, you know, look at what we've done to each other and what we've done to nature and to animals and all of that. Is it possible uh, to design for good? Is it possible to design for tomorrow? What do you think? So maybe I can start. Um, 
I think maybe it's relevant for this answer to say that one of the things I do is that I, I teach design ethics amongst other things. I think it's a bit relevant. So uh, maybe you understand I'm going to give a pretty long answer uh, because of course, like the theoretical answer is yes, but I think that in practice, the way design and UX and the field is nowadays, uh, I would say no. And to give an, uh, an even more uh, provocation to, uh, as an answer, um, and because we're doing devil's advocate and it's good to provoke um, in, in, in the same way if we made a provocative, like a provocative design. So in order to provoke and take the extreme uh, point to to drive an, uh, an argument home, I would say that UX as it is currently is actually evil, and the um, the net benefit that it adds is not there for a number of reasons that uh, there is a long explanation. But I think that as a sector, uh, we haven't managed uh, to. To, again, to be provocative, to go a bit more beyond decoration and have uh, true impact in policy at a planetary level. Of course, there are good things happening here and there. We all know, and we have worked on locally good projects. We have worked with good people. Um, but I don't see the the overall uh, effect. We have been now around for quite some time uh, and as a field and the negative uh, side effects of modern production uh, go on despite our existence. We don't seem to, to be able to be a meaningful uh, break in the, the, the negatives. I would say so this is my provocation this is my devil's advocate and of course there are many asterisks there which i assume are going to be parts of the of the discussion so don't take it literally take it as a provocation for discussion mm -hmm. i always uh, make a point to try and emphasize to people that when we're addressing a certain situation it's about the situation and it's about the topic and it's better to you know, channel your feelings to that instead of the people delivering the messages because yeah you know I think the the old saying is don't shoot the messenger <laughs> and that exists exists for a reason because we're quick to to sort of react out of our own you know, you know like uh, personal attachments so yeah and then uh, Xavier what do you think I think there's different 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 factors, and and, and I agree with uh, with Ivan. So there's, if you go back in history of the impact of design and how has been the correlation of design and politics, if you want to bring it, and how disruptive uh, design can be, and how much design can have an impact into into society, and that how can create change that creates two sides, right? So there's the side where people don't understand if then the people start mixing design and art when something becomes too too much and too extreme because it's not solving a problem and that can create the pushback. Um, and then there's the other side where design has a positive impact but is not understood as a design. And this is where the gaps are getting a little bit tricky and then how how we fulfill this, this um, these little gaps, right? And it's not only happening in design, it's happening in architecture. If we, if we put everything in, in one bucket, right? How aggressive or how disruptive design can be to make the change or to make the impact into the minds of the people, into the society, right? And how we can, how we can address this. Can we make it through one product? Can we have it as a physical product? Can we have it as a digital element? Is this having something? Or nowadays it's all this afraid about and that's a really interesting topic about ethics is like how AI can affect and how we design AI in an ethical way and why people are getting so much afraid. Is this too much? Is we are doing things in, it's now in media everywhere where people use AI to design certain elements that people got completely in panic, right? And that's where you start touching 
the, the, the afraid of the people because sometimes it's a lack of misunderstanding, right? So it's just like lack of knowledge is a new thing and that is sometimes is pushing back. But you need to, to always step out of this comfort zone to, to shake a little bit the tree, to, 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 to create a little bit of noise to find some certain, certain answers, I would say, because more is in that direction. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I've noticed is that in our um, in our various fields, certain things, you know, the, the same metrics that apply to greenwashing and whitewashing also applies to design. And sometimes certain things are labeled as design, even though it's not exactly design. And the the example that I think I, I use it frequently, and if you've listened to me before, you might think I sound boring because I'm repeating. Um, but you know, I, I studied some uh, public relations, and during that time, I was um, introduced to uh, Eddie Bernays, not, not not the actual person, but his work, and he is the father of public relations. So he was hired and he created public relations basically because um yeah the government needed to find a way to um yeah to 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 make propaganda palatable because during the the war at that time they used the russian propaganda to showcase you know what propaganda looks like and so they couldn't use this technique anymore and all, of course most governments do um, but yeah, you don't have to just look at government because businesses um, also reflect government. And I think, you know, if you look at propaganda to PR and then PR to um, marketing, advertising and also design, you can sort of see that influence. And especially in UX, because UX is, uh, you know, founded in a lot of psychology or at least uh, human behavior. And this is also where dark design comes from, because you can use, you know, if I come to you and I say, Xavier, what is your problem? Um, can I solve it for you? Then your information, you sharing your information is valid and I solve your problem. But if I'm like, hmm, this guy has got a problem, how am I going to uh, get his money and make him not a problem? Then, then the, the interaction changes. So, so how we exploit the possibilities i think is one of the main main factors in why one might say that design ux design is evil so in the pursuit of designing for a better uh, future what are some of the unintended consequences or negative outcomes that designers and innovators should be uh, wary of and how can they mitigate these uh, risks And I will just go. like I will yeah I will just would like to make one comment about what what you what you mentioned about design and media and PR etc right and that's a good a good example so when when we talk about design there's a lot about it's not about the UX only but back on times when it was graphic designers and then you have agencies and you had a lot of people drafting really kind of aggressive campaigns with a lot of impact right so we're create kind of a different mindset and how people perceive different things. I think that's the, the key for me is when, when when we are designers would like to claim that designers, we see things from a different way, right? And we see things different and we try to be more humans. And that's that's a part that's sometimes more complicated since we try to be more empathic and understand who is on the other side, we're able to craft something that creates an impact. And this sometimes creates this fear, like, okay, these guys know what to touch and that can be really dangerous. And that's for me sometimes interesting, but it's our, you know, poker card, it's like how we can use to, to create the impact and how we transform the message, how we communicate it. Doesn't matter what is, which is the vehicle, the vehicle that we're using. And nowadays we can continue doing that, right? And we can claim it as a UX. And of course with UX now there's tons of methodologies, tons of research and ways to discover and to use data and how, how, and then comes the other topic of ethics, right? So how we use data and which kind of data we can use to create changes or impacts in ethical 
an ethical way. And now I stop a let Ivan or Stefan to, to pick up. Um, I have an answer on similar uh, lines, uh, small differentiation. I see in practice a lot um, many of the consequences that happen that are not anymore. And again, to be provocative, I don't think that all of them are unintended. So, for example, there are some methods like uh, design sprints or uh, personas that have very, very known limitations. They, are, I have nothing against them, but they have some cri criteria to pull them off well. And we know how dangerous it is to use them in practice if these criteria are not met. Uh, however, we see them again and again in practice that many teams, uh, companies, even either multinationals or um, uh, startups or NGOs, they don't invest uh, effort and time to meet this criteria, but they want to go to the quick solution like, okay, let's do a design sprint without taking care if you have the right people in the room or uh, because then your input is going to be like meaningless more or less um, uh, the same with personas that if they are done without some consultation with actual people with actual users then they're just theorizing they are not like a persona of anyone uh, and these are just examples. Uh, I don't want to be to to focus on these specific uh, things, but these are examples that we know as a field for a long time, and we don't seem to be like every time. I see a lot of complacency that every time that you say, uh, "Well, maybe we should uh, we shouldn't just start it. Maybe we should plan a bit better the design sprint or whatever it is." Then sometimes you get a lot of, um, 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 I don't know, negative reactions, let's say, maybe even from people in, in UX teams that know you're like a naysayer and uh, you're a negative person. It's like as if it is about the personality. It's like, no, I'm, I'm like supporting a position that we should prepare our artifacts according to their proper criteria it has nothing to do with me as a person but it's I see a lot of um, complacency and conformism that uh, let's just get this project done and then we'll do it better in the next one or uh, we need to do this by this deadline or this quarter because people want to get bonuses and so on so this become more important in the day-to-day -day. so like the day-to-day -day ethics, not just the, the data and the AI and the hot topics that people talk about in ethics, but the boring ethics, the day-to-day -day in the office. I think this is something, again, because of my teaching gig, I think that uh, young designers, they don't really know how to behave in these situations. Um, these are when we talk about these things like how to be a professional is when I get most of the questions by students so I think actually back to your question that this is maybe a mitigation mechanism that maybe we should be talking more about uh, this uh, stuff maybe we should be teaching more um, this stuff it's not going to make anything perfect but i think it's going to to help us hold each other a bit more accountable than we we do at the moment i, I found it quite curious because when i studied um I, I i did a year of law i did um some training in public relations and also in multimedia all of that in south africa and through all of those studies ethics was uh was one of the, the the subjects that we covered um but from what i hear a lot of people that i've worked with have never even heard of ethics um and so i think you know why what is it that south africa is special and they include it in their education or is it excluded here for a, a specific purpose um 
Now, also on top of that, while I did study, did have some trading on ethics, the majority of what I remember uh, about it is don't don't price your work unfairly so that you can uh, so that you put others out of uh, work. Um, but I, I guess there were some conversations at that time. I didn't really, I I didn't um, it didn't affect me. Um, because yeah, I needed a job and I'm going to do my job. Um, and I think that's a lot of young designers. Um, that's also why I have the panel on empowerment later this week, because, you know, the, these issues, why do they exist is because we all need jobs and we all need money to survive. Um, if you don't have money and you end up on the street, life is pretty terrible. Um, so the sort of fuels that rat race and I think you know in many ways when you see poverty uh, those people live an unforgiving life and an unforgiving life is a very devastating and hard life to live so I think we're all sort of like fearful of that um, and so then it boils down back just to the people you know why what motivates us to to do what we do um, do you, if if UX is not uh, good, is there? Do you think that humanity can be good enough that we can make the changes and not rely on a on a on a subject per se? I think, I think ethics should not be just teach be teach it just in design, right? So it's one of the pillars in many of the foundations of what we have. Um, doesn't matter what you do, what you have, and it should be something that has to be teach it in the early stage. So sometime, some, somehow ethics, the word ethics sounds like uh, this nothing to do with me, but at the same time, everyone's want to be treated with, with, on a proper way. And back back into the into ethics and design and your question if it's just in south africa etc i also had like i think it was a full year of of uh, ethics and ethics and design etc but was was more was kind of a mix or was like a navigation between okay what was the ethics in art but also what what that was this implication in in design but really like high level without going deep because teachers they had certain in back on time they had certain afraid that people will connect it too less into the tangible factors as a designer you should deliver, right? And less thinking about it. Um, back to one sentence that um, Ivan said that I really like is the part of conformism. And I think nowadays, and I, I fully agree on, on the topic of design sprints, personas, all the exercises that you can mention, people, for what I see, and I see people really, I do a course three weeks and then I know personas, I know how to do personas. And just they do it, not because they believe that is what they have to do, it's just they do it because it's like, oh, I learned this, this is the process I have to follow, this is the KPI I have to check, I have a persona, I don't know what the persona is. I know the definition, but I don't know the, the implication of it. And and I agree that can be so, so dangerous, right? Or you, you discuss with a manager and then the manager is saying, oh no, you guys, you have to do the personas in two hours. Like, but two hours, but which kind of data? No, just create something. And then like, well, this is this is dangerous, not, not for me. I mean, you can you can pay, that's fine, but it's dangerous for your business because you're still losing a lot of information. And the product that, that you're going to deliver most likely will not be ethic to, to, to the customs that you want to, to bring, right? So there's so many dangerous points that people, I think people take now all these methods by the book without really thinking what is the implication of these methods and just they're doing it just by the sake of doing it. And I know that sounds rough, but it requires a little bit of thinking behind, right? So, and this is also sometimes what I try to, to explain to, to new designers or people who work that I work with, together with, like sometimes even you don't like it, this takes time. The same then if you need to cook, I don't know, uh, two kilos beef in the oven, you will not put it 15 minutes. You will put it a little bit longer because there's certain rules to cook the beef and then you can eat it, right? So, and this goes in the same direction. Why you need to do certain things in a short time just for the sickness of time? And of course it's money, but 
what will be the implication later on? What will be the cost of not really taking care of this, right? And, and I think this this point of compromise, I really like it, and this mitigation part, I really, that's just a line that I really took it. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. So to go back to 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 the question, to to add to to what Javier was saying, is that one part is that. For example, I had designed the course on design ethics um, many years ago, and I was trying to find a school to teach it. So it wasn't the case that the, the school hired me in Europe, and it was really difficult to find a school to, to teach it. So this is my personal experience. I don't, I haven't done research on all the, the schools. Um, so credit to uh, the Instituto Europeo de Design for for taking my my course. Um, then, uh, yeah, I I really um, uh, like the the um, uh, everything that um, uh, Javier said, and just to add something, it's a bit. I understand also it's it, what you you said about uh, people wanting to avoid the precarious position in their job, and this is a contributing factor to conformism. It's not just culture, but it's also necessity at some point. And for this reason, it is unfair to put all this pressure on individual designers. Um, Humanity can be good, but we also need institutions. It's highly unlikely that individuals can carry all this weight. This is, these are issues that are bigger than each of us. And right now we don't have something that's, I don't know what the solution is because this is not like one person is not going to make up the solution. We need like to come together to figure out what, what uh, happens, but what I know is that most of us do things with software and right now um, if a, a car or a like radio device uh, has something broken they're going to recall it and you're not going to have the the product until they fix it but with software it's not the same, like they find these companies for uh, violations and their products are still up while they they, they pay the, the fine. And we don't have an institution to say, hang on, like did they actually fix the thing? And then the second effect of having an, inst an institution is the increased accountability. So if you are a doctor doing nasty things, then you will have your license revoked and you will not be uh, a doctor anymore. And it's the same with engineers and uh, the software people, they don't have the same thing, but at least there is uh, ACM, the Association of uh, Computational Machinery, and they have a code of ethics. So at least internally for their own events and their own trainings, uh, they have a code of ethics, which is actually quite good. Uh, if you go to uh, this amazing uh, resource, that's, um, let me get the URL right, ethicaldesign.guide ethicaldesign.guide they also have in the resources the ACM code of ethics and many other ethical things uh, so there are other fields that we can look at and take inspiration about how we can come together and solve our issues we shouldn't try to copy a solution so because I mentioned doctors or ACM, it doesn't mean that they're both good examples, but so we cannot do both. We have to pick one or the other. But I think we need more institutions because um, like I was watching, the, I watched like a couple of years ago, this uh, Mark Zuckerberg depositions at uh, the US Congress. It was 10 hours. I watched all of it and it was a fascinating watch. I, I recommend it if you are into design and the implications of design in society. 
there were so many questions that the Congress people were yeah. dancing around usability issues and accessibility issues, and they never formed the straight question like, oh, you said that you have built this capacity um, into your platform. Have you tested it? That Does it actually work for people? They never asked the question, which, which led me to believe that we have not made enough of an impact as a sector to be able to, for, for a Congress person to, to, to ask this, uh, even though they were so, they were so close. <laughs> um so yeah i think we can do it uh but uh yeah i don't know how myself but i'm open to to cheer the the efforts i think xavier has got something to say yeah, yeah definitely because I, I think it's really interesting again two super good lines i think this comparison about if if a doctor just together with the time right and then the process so if a doctor goes into an operation and decides to say well a heart operation that has to take i don't know i don't know how long it takes let's say three hours and then as i know you know now i'm going to do it in one hour and then the result is not the best well most likely these guys going to lose the job right but and he can argue whatever but he didn't do did the proper steps and perhaps these of doing it in one hour instead of three hours is saving money to the hospital, electricity, whatever. But this is not an ethical argument to change the way. So that goes directly into the design design topic. And I think sometimes we need to, it's there are easy examples, and sometimes I needed to, to bring it more into certain cabinets and certain levels to, to really put these clear examples, maybe talk that they understand about it. The other point that I really like is the politics, right? So and 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 we still unfortunately in a situation where most of the politicians and as, as you also mentioned Ivan and what they, they don't understand what they're talking about and that was visible when they have been making their questions to to him right they have been making the question going around but not a stepping exactly into the question because it was feelable on the face is that they had not been knowing what they have been talking about somebody some consultant from another consultancy wrote this text to the guys make these questions but then at the moment that was really needed to go deep was like well i cannot go there because i don't understand and this is really that creates a lot of afraid right so this is like okay that digitalization we talk about movement and moving forward we talk about going green etc but in reality there's no much understanding behind and i think this also comes because we need to, to break this bias about how much impact we can create by the solutions that we do. And we need to educate more and to show more and that they are able to, to understand and, and showing more and more and bit by bit by repeating the message perhaps will be certain understanding, right? But clearly should should be in, in a political level understanding of it and not just bench of consultancies covering doesn't matter which political party bringing the questions or the answers that they think that they're going to satisfy the, the rest of the people. Uh, Xavier, um, a beautiful um, anecdote popped to my mind, uh, which is half baked ideas. And I think that's basically the picture you're painting. Don't go to market with half baked ideas. Um, but interestingly, I also made notes about law and politics. And I think Conventionally, we've relied as society on on the legal uh, justice system and sort of from a political perspective to ensure that the playing field is fair and that, you know, we're we have a sort of safe environment. If you look at first world, the the very basic ideas of the first world is that we're safe and protected and you know, um, the third South Africa, for example, was a third world. And while I was living there, I always looked up to, um, you know, the first world countries because they're so civilized and what have you and what have you not. And yet when you come here and you dive beneath, beneath the veneer, you see that, well, there's issues here as well. But um, so in, in Africa, you could go find some spot where you could just live, you know. There's not a lot, but if if 
if needs be, you can sort of go out into nature. And here in Europe, we're very on top of each other. And, you know, if you look at the urban design and the social design, everything sort of attacks um, the victims and also uh, poorer people. Um, actually, here in the Netherlands, there's a lot of media about the government and their attacking of uh, poorer people. And so this this body that we installed to to give us you know to to be an authoritative voice to provide the securities for us uh they no longer adhere to that and so i think that's where the issue comes in because well as a designer things should be illegal if it's in, in any in any, any field things should be illegal if it's harmful and the fact that it's not therein lies the question for me and i think um one of the key issues in technology is that it's rapidly evolving and it's new, always new. And so prior to technology, we dealt with this, the same sort of issues always. We still have those same issues, but on top of that, we have technology and how that develops. So you cannot really make a law about things that you know nothing of yet. And because there's sort of this tug between government and business and society on, on certain levels, uh, businesses often don't want to share with government what they're doing. Um, and so government obviously has no idea. So it's sort of bringing those those industries together and bridging the divide. And even uh, that's what I said to you, it's, it's great to have somebody who sort of has this uh, bird's eye view of of, of of the different industries because then you can also see where they fit together and start tracing those challenges. Um, so do you guys have any ideas on how we could dive into that or tackle it or where we can start to address those sort of issues? Should we, should we for example, um, one of the propositions of the design governance panel is that you know we designers should um, intellectually analyze our work and um Xavier and Stefan, I think you're both aware of the UXPA. Um, so um, there there are sort of people who want to create organizations to govern the design, um, what is design and what is good design. Um, so I think that's emerging. Do you guys see anything that, that can add to that? And also that from a devil's advocate uh, perspective. I absolutely agree with Evan that UX has become completely even, evil um, due to the bandwagon jumpers of, hey, I'm a marketeer. And if I put UX before my UI or before my graphics design, then I'm going to jump the bandwagon. So the roots of Papa Smurf, uh, Don Norman or Hartmut Esslinger, the guys who created those um, approaches, um, they were completely washed away over the past decades. And it's good that we are now separating uh, the artistry from the human-centered point of view. Because as you guys mentioned before, the only true validation, not verification, not falsification, can be both of something working or wor not working, something being good, benefiting towards health. Uh, ISO 9241 even states that we as human-centered designers have to adhere to human health and well-being one fundamental goal of the sustainability development of goals. I think it's number three of 17. Um, so to close that circle, it's good that we are starting to expel um, the arts or separate. It doesn't need to be, to be expelled. It's just not human-centered because if human-centered means uh, it's only for human health and well-being, um, then we have to separate artistry from uh, creating functions that are psychology based that are where UX originally came from like Don Norman is like a major in technology and in psychology Hartmut Esslinger was a major in electromechanics and industrial design 
and they came together and created something with Apple or any other brands that are out there that was really human centered and now bears fruit. And to finish my argument, I already see something blossoming up that I've discussed with a colleague uh, today, the European Accessibility Act that is now set into motion. And from next year on, it will be punishable by law in your state, not mine, since I am in Switzerland. Uh, we are not following suit so fast. In Switzerland, people are watching and uh, seeing how the punishments of companies that do not adhere to the minimum criteria of including people will work out. And most likely in 2025 or a little bit later, we'll follow suit and then also say as Switzerland sometimes does, yep, I think it works. It's ethically okay, so we can follow up. So that's good. And we have created, like, we're in the discussion. So we're expelling design for design sake or for me, I'm doing it for me and saying, okay, whom is it for? We're starting to test. Some of my clients have cautiously been like, hmm, maybe we should test because it saves us one four hundredth of the money we would have spent if we would have developed chips and then it was the wrong product. Um, so I see it in a positive kind of light, but I am with Evan. UX has become really evil. You know, it's funny because my perceptions turns it around. So for me, art is very human centered and science is not. So science is supposed to be very logical. You have to uh, test and validate, test and validate. And, you know, you can't really change it because somebody feels a certain way. Um, uh, and for me, the 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 psychology is actually the bad guy. Um, so when Eddie Bernays started propaganda, um, his cousin is Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud actually used his behavioral uh, data studies uh, to feed to uh, Eddie so that they could then um, persuade the public. So that's the first issue that I have with psychology. And then the second issue that I have with psychology is, um, so last year, 2022, uh, scientists finally proved that there's no such thing as chemical imbalances causing depression, and that the, the, the industry had known it for a really long time, and still they chose to medicate people because it was more profitable, and also because they could deal with certain issues, people who were raising certain issues in a certain way, claiming that they're crazy or, you know, unstable and all of that. So that's that's that issue with psychology. And then the next issue with psychology is the psychology of psychology it, itself. So I, in my opinion, everything is sort of interlinked. And each each one of these topic topics has its positives and its negatives. And, you know, we're not all seeing the entire world all of the time as it is, we only see what is in our environments and what we sort of interact um, with. So I think when, we, when we're when we able to collect all of these pain points throughout all of the industries and see how those come together, then we're sort of coming closer to, to solving the issues. Um, do, you, do any of you feel that psychology can be useful in solving some of the issues that it's also created. Just one small interjection. I always tend to say, we humans would love to be logical, but we are psychologically driven. There is emotions, there is um, spirits within us, let's call it ethereal like that, but neurological processes that command us from what we sense, what we are able to perceive through cognition, recognition, and then through motory action, put it into something outward. So mm -hmm. I claim if that is psychology and, that, and if we are all human and if 99% of humankind work in a similar kind of fashion, then we may conclude that humans do act psychologically based and we would have to explore 
the areas of psychology in a logical kind of fashion more and more to understand more. Because Sigmund Freud was hundreds, hundred years ago, is like saying, hey, do you remember Darwin? Because Darwinism is false, but um, we still say, hey, he was the father of a modern kind of worldview but he has been false in many kind of areas. So was Freud. He was a pseudoscientist, but at least he experimented and tried something out. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's important also to, like, for example, Freud was very clear when he was writing that uh, um, there was lack of knowledge so let's talk to people because we cannot scan a brain yet so at least he was he knew like his uh limitations so i think that many freudists who later became fanatics of his ideas were a lot worse than himself uh, because at least he was open to the possibility of being wrong uh, <laughs> But um, I think that with regard to psychology, something that's useful, how we think like in in uh, ethics about technology, and I think in the same way about uh, psychology, that it's not neutral. Um, but um, so give me a study and show me the design and what it is for and who it was designed by and then i will tell you like about this specific like it's designed for a purpose uh the same way like uh, technology uh, it's not neutral so um it depends like when uh, i like this field of uh, philosophy that has to do with uh, ethics that's called phenomenology and it's uh, a bit about show me the real thing let's not talk about the idea of psychology let's not talk about the books but let's talk about the actual studies that are happening right now and this is like the effective the active psychology that we have right now so is doing a study with a hundred undergrads at the university representative of the overall population uh, i would say no and again i go back to a previous answer sorry if i'm boring but we kind of know this like if we do user studies and we don't have a representative sample then it's not a good study this is not rocket science like we don't have excuses <laughs> we have to be better and i agree with all the like what uh, Stefan mentioned about also the how to to propagate mis mitigation measures, I agree with a lot, and I understand his uh, optimism. Uh, I wouldn't underestimate how much time it would take, uh, because again, this is anecdotal. I don't have a study, but I I called some uh, female colleagues of mine who are much better in. Uh, than me in in the job that we do to participate in the panel and they were afraid that by participating in a devil's advocate uh, panel they would be outcast socially by, the, by their male employees at work we don't have a good way to 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 treat that like what do you go to the uxpa to complain do you go to HR? HR has no in incentive to to treat something like that. It's not even in the workplace. Um, so we we understand how to mitigate, how to propagate many of the mitigation effects, but I I think we're not there yet. We have a lot more work to do. So while you were busy speaking, when you started, um, you apologized for uh, being boring and you did that before as well. And then I made a note here about, um, you know, the sort of interactions that you get. So, you know, in the in the world as is, we need to survive. 
and sometimes you need to lower the bar just to do that. Um, of course, it's not your fault that it is like that, but uh, you still need to lower the bar. Then there are those who really profit off of that. So one of the main things happening in the world with people addressing key issues and this, you know, I've spoken about the whistleblowers as well, how they, you know, their whole lives can get ruined because they bring certain things to the surface. So I don't think what you're saying is boring at all. Um, but I think that you're cognitive of that and sort of aware of that because the people who are exploiting the, that which you're talking of, like, oh, so boring, you know, and the the image that you can use for that is like a teenage boy and uh, a teenage girl. And he's like, oh, you're so boring. You're not giving out, you know, that, that you hear in the teenage world all the time, you know, and it's like, it's the same, high school never ends. <laughs> high school never ends um we just become more sophisticated in 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 the way that we behave these ways and i recognize that i've had these jobs where you know i've gone to hr and i was like guys and they didn't know what to do and i sought training outside of my work and there, there, there is no playbook. Um, and then with the UXPA, um, one concern that I have is also the cost. Um, so if you um, if you want to join this, you need to pay a certain amount and then you get approved as a proper designer. And I feel that that should already be the case when we leave university. I mean, in many places, my, my education was expensive. My, my education was hell of an expensive. Um, it's not as cheap as it is here in Europe. And so to pay that much money and to spend so much time, you should have some level of, yeah, of being able to, of uh, just ability. So then that question comes back to uh, education and education, the, the, the stuff that we study is often it comes from a governmental place, institutional place. So then we come right back to the politics. So I think that's my next question. What is our role in politics and what is design's role in politics? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think the role, the design, so the how to put it? So I think design plays a big role in politics. So and had been playing always, and had been in in different in different sectors. <clears throat> so you can take it how I don't know how if a designer creates something that really becomes you know disruptive and people want to have it, but doesn't fit into the mindset of the politics of certain country, that will have a massive in, impact into the politics, right? And you can, and sometimes we are, we are seeing it just from our, the perspective of, of our countries or where we are living. But if some designs that for us in Europe, they are normal, if you bring it to Middle East, you bring it to China, you bring it somewhere, that will have a massive move. That will create a massive you know, noise in a, in a political level, right? Doesn't mean that politicians are going to take it and do it, but will create a move that that will have a political impact. And I think it was like five years ago, it was, uh, it was an exhibition, I, I don't remember what it was, I think it was Berlin, that was about the impact of, or it was in Munich, but it doesn't matter. So it was like the impact of uh, design and in, in politics and actually had been showing since, I don't know, since, po since posters had been created in Berlin to, because that had been designed and people trying to forget that it was like, you know, trim was existing and that had a massive impact to our daily technologies, that these technologies also have been designed or how we are using cars, bikes, or certain levels of transportation. And this has, a, has an impact into the society. And the moment that you design something with impact into society indirectly or directly trying to have an impact into the political situation. The question is, if politicians reach the point to understand what is the impact of design and how beneficial design can be for a political situation, right? So we have a crisis and I think it was, uh, I don't remember which architect it, it is, um, and it's an architect from Japan. 
And there was a massive catastrophe and he, he designed houses based on carton just to, to have something quick solution to fix a political a catastrophe, but was at the end was like a political situation. So this architect came with a really brilliant design idea to solve a problem, which at the end saved us, sorry for my French, but saved us of a certain politician because came to a, with a brilliant solution, right? And this is the impact sometimes of design. And then that makes things like, ah, oh, you know, that makes can make, make a change. And, and if you look back in history, as you mentioned also in PR, communication, political communication, et cetera, always had been designers involved in a certain, certain direction, right? And you can bring it to pop art, you can bring it to any scene that create kind of a political move on this on the streets and i think that's that's quite interesting and then of course now topic as i mentioned before all the topic ai and the ethics of ai or accessibility topic this is also how sometimes it's said to when you think about it such a sensitive topic like accessibility right and digital accessibility if you want to go more in detail became so political and now a bunch of politics or law people wrote laws about accessibility which yeah there are some of them that are okay but my question sometimes is how many designers have been involved on the decisions of what means accessibility or not accessibility right because you look at it and it's like mm, nice that's a nice law to target somebody and you have to follow this and you're going to be have, have a fine which is a way to measure things but sometimes it's like there's no sense of design also inside Right? And you feel it, you, you, can, you can smell it. And where, where are the boundaries and where, where are this, this understanding and where is the, the involvement of design and, and politics and to create a positive impact into a society at the end? Yeah. I definitely agree with that one. You say, Javier. But the good thing about that is, especially regarding accessibility there's a chance because there's not yet any authority that really assesses okay you're certified so it's a constant uh, task that is possible it opens up a whole hellish kind of door uh, i also had that with the same colleague i mentioned before today he said yeah if our um uh, what, what's that called in english um competitors if our competitors try to unleash hell upon us they can just nitpick and go through the list of things that we do wrong and then we will be fined 5k uh, euros each week that we are not able to fix the 138 issues that they find so it's social experimentation in progress but at least and coming back to the architectural uh, background i mean how was the code of ethics in engineering found? There had to be a few bridges, bridge catastrophes in America to happen before people were like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't make bolts out of wood. Maybe we should have a minimum criterion towards that. Hmm. And answering your question from my perspective, um, Candice was like, Yes, we should have those tools when we come out of university, but there's so many different standards. Like in Austria, for example, industrial design has been taught as a technological job. So I have an engineering degree in that. But in other countries like Italy, it's still a master of arts. So there is not even a standard in there. I have been taught statistical mathematics and ethics uh, on an engineering scale. Whereas in Italy, where I went for studies as a postgraduate, uh, I was astounded, like dumbfounded of the program that was then there uh, offered to us. I was like, what research is drawing? I was like, uh, I think I am wrong here. I feels like arts class. Uh, so UXPA or UXPA is, is a good way to like accredit people in a certain kind of area of human-centered design according to certain acceptance criteria and they need funding and also like free education seems to be not so valued by people okay. so maybe if it costs a little we here in, in switzerland have the swiss ict it's also costing money to be a member and they have uh, studies that they finance with that 
that in return are given to us back where we have salary reviews and quality reviews and all those kind of things that get our quality up 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 so it's it's a self funding kind of uh, issue so i think it's i think it's optimistic i think it's good i have a million devil's advocate uh, questions <laughs> Um, so one thing that um, that I'm addressing in the design empowerment and the design governance uh, panels is um, is uh, sorry um, which one is it? Yeah, the exclusivity of the design industry. So design is already something that um, can be quite costly to get into, and then on top of that you know if you look at the in-group out-group mentalities um the designers who typically win the awards so I've, I've, I've been nominated for some awards and then i go and i give my details and stuff and then oh you need five thousand euros to enter this competition and so that excludes a whole lot of people now one of the major issues i think we all have different uh, views what one of the major issues that we face is the luxury mindset issue now when you're so self-contained in this bu bubble of reaffirmation and self-confirmation then often you only take on your own ideas while excluding the rest and this is often what i see with people who try to solve uh, poverty um Sometimes they live in such luxury that they think that other people's problems are the same as theirs. And so they try and solve it with the same uh, same methods, but then it's not no longer applicable. So in my belief, the best way to leverage and harness design to its full capacity is through inclusivity, the including, in, including multiple people. And then I had a very... Um, like a, a question about the legality. So from accessibility, there's all of these legal things coming. Um, and yet we don't see the same legislation for dark design and unethical design. And I think, Evan, you can really touch on this more detailed than me, but this is my, this is, this is the image I get. So am I wrong? What, it, what is, what is causing this sort of vision to, to appear to me? So to to give like one kind of answer to to both questions, both the luxury and the dilemma about how far do the legislators go with regard to the companies, a lot has to do with the current economy. That if you have a, a company, an agency, or a business that makes the same profit every year, even if this pro or every quarter even if this profit is really high and comfortable, this is considered actually bad. They call this like a zombie business because you have to have growth. So your profits need to grow and grow and grow. And this in a world with uh, limited resources. In this world, it makes it very difficult for a a community co-design solution to win an award uh, because obviously it's going to have certain attributes that have to do with practicalities because it's a community design um, as opposed to to centralized uh, design and the legislators um, are in this position that the companies also create jobs and they have all this lobbying pressure to uh, keep them running on the one hand. On the other hand, they show some positive aspects. Uh, I think, I don't think it's only the Accessibility Act, but I think that also the, um, um, uh, what it's called, the Digital Markets uh, act and also the ai act they have some positive aspects uh, into it with regard to to ethics they the, the, we see at least in i know in europe but also i see in other jurisdictions we see some steps in the right direction um but it goes back to what you were saying that this te 
technology, because it's based on a growth economy, it changes so fast that we see steps in the right direction. But uh, I am a bit worried that, like, are we doing enough? Um, and if we had kind of a more institutional approach as a sector, would we be more effective? Because we are not like lobbying anyone to do anything at the moment. Um, so I don't know, things are going in the right direction, but are we moving fast enough to avoid like a climate uh, collapse? Um, I don't have an answer. Yeah. So another devil's advocate question, and this one especially for you, Stefan. Um, so for the AI and ethics event that we had in January, um, I sort of dived into ethics a little bit more in detail, and I searched for search. Sorry, I searched for certain search. I searched for certain uh, cases, and one one ex example that I found was um, where a group of people were calling for accessibility, and um, and people were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, accessibility, who, who, who?" And then this group went um, they associated with the pronoun "map," and "map" refers to minor attracted people. Um, and so this is also that greenwashing and the whitewashing. I, I'm not really sure how to term that in design, but in design, as in all other industries, you have the cer same certain mechanics where something that is essentially good and well intended, like accessibility, is exploited by others who then, you know, sort of try and make it um, useful for them as well, even though they're causing more harm. To the greater good or the greater collective than any other group um, yeah that is true um but i do not know how to to hinder that from happening so uh, if anyone has a recipe for that like let me know in the direct messages of linkedin or any other tool that i'm currently using uh, as i said before in in my point of view it's a social experiment that is ongoing and that's called humanity mm -hmm. in, as you mentioned before in the first world we have first world kind of problems in the second world or third world we have a different kind of problems so it's uh, as as designers like I, and there i quote my my friend and mentor he said the only people or in his point of view like the only people who can change systems who are change makers and it's our duty is designers not design not anything but as designers and if they could do it back then in the 1970s where designers were asked to work for free on a regular basis or pay companies to be able to work for them we are in a very comfortable spot because i am at least i am getting paid here for what I'm doing currently at, at my company in, in Switzerland. And it's okay, it's a really good job that I'm getting paid. And uh, to be able to, to speak with you guys here. And it's, it's also a percentage kind of thing that I'm looking, how likely is it to be misused? Is there only psychopaths out there? Or are we as humans, as a group of being a principled uh, social being? And numbers from studies that I had read on psychopathy, and narcissism, and those kind of traits that are uh, egotistical and ethically bad, or counterproductive, as I would call them for a social uh, construct, are in the minority. So if we still work in this grassroots movement, in this, okay, let's seed the positive aspects, aspects and let's lead by example and put mm -hmm. case studies up and stack them up more and more. Um, it will come after time. And as Evan said, it's gonna take time, but that's why I'm reading in my free time, uh, Isaac Asimov uh, Foundation books, because it's like, okay, a thousand years later. <laughs> So that concludes my answer to that question. Um, and Xavier, I think you 
you sort of have one of the you oversee one of the biggest your your role um you oversee a big uh company with lots of designers and so what we're talking about what Stefan is saying uh, essentially is that there should be more responsible on the shoulders a responsibility on the shoulders of designers now that was another um yeah, another question uh, that comes up in some of the other panels as well, and how do we balance the responsibility versus the ability, um, the empowerment? So uh, you must design better, and then you get to a company and they give you this brief, and you're like, I'm just doing my job, and nothing really happens. Um, do you have any input on that? I think it's... It doesn't matter also the size. Uh, I, I think it's kind of we are in a, and we have been talking during during the during the panel. There's this part of comfort that we that we are reaching, and I see more and more new generation of designers that they are looking for this comfort, right? So like I remember back when 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 I started design was just I want to have an impact. I want to, you know, I can work for free. I want to learn. I, I'm hungry. I want to make change. I want to be these guys that I saw that can make a change. I want to have a proper solution. They have a positive impact in society, right? So that was my drive as a designer. And now when I make this question to, to new generation of designers, and then you have many of them, everyone coming from different sector now design is really fragmented different chapters if you want to call it and some of them they don't know where they are but then you say what do you want to do and they're like they don't have a clear answer and they don't look for this drive of having an impact on and i think it's like some of the education got transformed that they don't believe that their design has the power of change Right? And and these 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 mindsets somehow got got lost. They 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 jump into a situation. The digital design is moving so fast that it's like they are they, they consider themselves part of the chain, and they need just to deliver against what the client is asking or who whatever is asking. And I think it's just they they don't appreciate enough what what they can do, what they're able to do. Right and what, what we try more and more is to open this door, right? To say, you are able to do that, right? So you, your career is not just stopping just as a receiving a brief deliver. There's not even briefs anymore. And as we spoke also about the design sprints and all this stuff, it's just, you just put a designer inside. The designer will do something. The designer will do a nice PPT. The designer will do something. And now this Figma. And Figma, you can have this and you can go faster. But the mindset of, what is the problem that I want to solve? What is the impact that I'm going to have? Is my solution having an ethical answer to what is the problem? And I'm able to convince through my mentality that, that we need to go to a slowdown. We need to ask the right questions. We need to analyze more. We need to make research. So we try to empower more and more new generation of designers to, to make the right questions, but also to believe that they can make a positive impact. And in a big organization where we work with many, 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 many clients from different sectors, trends will be complicated, but always we try to have this communication to also start educating our clients that they understand what is the impact of design and the beneficial impact of design in their accounts, companies, whatever it is. So bit by bit, when I look back now, three years back, and how much impact we had in inside client side, I'm quite quite happy to see the new generation already engaging with clients and making the right questions and explaining what is design, right? And starting like really like this is design. It's not just painting. This I can do it in two hours, but you want me to design something, I need time. And this is in the the message I will say. Mm. Yes, put on. Um Earlier, um, we were talking about, um, you know, the role of design in politics and in propaganda. And, and you know, it goes back even further, uh, design of religion. Uh, so if you look at 
the symbols that is used in uh, religion that's already making an emotional connection i remember when i was a child and i used to go to sunday school and i heard all of these terrible stories about this really nice man that loved me so much <laughs> and really you know I, I i had an emotional reaction and you know when i moved to europe I used to visit the churches, especially the older ones, because they have all those paintings and sculptures and, you know, the culture is very rich here. And all of it is so emotional. It's, you know, if if you're not really used to seeing those symbologies uh, often as we in Africa are not, um, it really hits you. Wow, this, this guy and the cross and these people crying and it's, you know, so I think design we we might give it different terms and the the application that we use changes um but i i most certainly think user experience has been around for as long as there has been people experiencing and design is just taking that experience and giving it a certain uh, meaning um so i've mentioned religion politics law education psychology um and all of these topics and i think that that shows that you know we have a lot of ground to cover then there's another topic which i'd like to um uh touch on which is uh design democratiz de design de democratization and this is something i hear about often and frequently and so while we're talking about design democratization i also want to consider as well that um, responsibility of the designer the you know who's responsible and what can he do in his job and yeah we can just start the conversation with who has something to say first i will go back to like the concept of phenomenology like let's see how it happens in practice because the idea is good but what do we mean do we mean that now um i cannot really design on my, my own anymore and other people are constantly on my file like moving their little cursors around and uh, i am constantly at, under surveillance or do we mean actually co-designing with uh, a community so now I see the first type happening more than the second. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm very suspicious by by this term, um, unless I see it in practice and then it's good and it's fine and I have nothing against it. But I have seen so much terminology being thrown around and then being appropriated for other purposes that on its own I don't think that um it's uh, it's it's um a differentiator um just before um the rest of you answer that uh, what what you just said I would like to propose that we get to a terminology to you know as we understand greenwashing there's a simple word for it we as the design industry should probably have a word where we can use to say well this is an example of greenwashing in design oh, sorry for the interruption please continue absolutely agree it'd be experience washing for example um but uh, that's only a perspective um i do agree with what evan said deeply and uh, going back to the to the to another topic or no <sighs> sorry Candice can you can you give me a cue because I lost my track here yeah no I was talking about you know the interconnectivity of everything so I mentioned design and uh, government and religion and education and then we went into design democratization and thanks that was it yeah. um my teacher always said democracy misunderstood so i truly believe in that 
we designers are not the decision makers, we're the facilitators of data that points towards negative or positive experiences. So as I said before, I'm a strong advocate for testing, testing, testing. As I said in a panel before, test the schnitzel out of any product because it will cost you one hundred one four hundred. And I, I belly flop with like projects before. It costs 400 times more to roll out half-baked ideas as you named it before compared to the testing, the one testing the, where we found crucial issues with usefulness of the product, wrong uh, personas that had been chosen as target groups, usability and accessibility. Accessibility coming before usability, I argue. Um, so one four hundred. So belly flop as often as you can. After three times, most likely you will have found eighty percent of of the of the issues with your usefulness, your accessibility, your usability, and your whole inclusion. So it's pretty easy, but it's a tough mindset to to get that because in in teams, designers are often put into the aesthetos, into the aesthetics, and not the ethos. So it has to be our um, effort as seniors. And yeah, I'm sorry to say that, guys, we are becoming the seniors. We're like in our 40s, sometimes 50s. And, and the young ones, they need us to guide them. So we need to learn business talk. We need to learn science talk in the, in the sense of analyzing data, interpreting uh, data, and putting it up for discussion so it's able to be perceived in management boardrooms. And we have to get ourselves into the management boardroom to be able to influence the decision makers. So those are my proposals, or my 50 cents on that regard. Democracy and misunderstood is my last word. I fully agree on this part of guiding um, and the part of more conversations into management, right? And the part of testing, and I don't know, for me, it's always crazy because I think since the, the, the digital topic is so fast and easy to change and you can do a change left and right, they, they consider the cost is not as high as if you don't test something in a car where, where the malls of a car are costing so much money and of course, then you need to test certain materials or in aviation, right? You need to test, okay, is how many flights the plane can take and that the material of the wings is going to be, you know, still working. And everyone in their head is like, yeah, this is totally rational, makes totally sense. But when we bring it into a digital topic, everyone is like, wow, why would we have to test? This is easy, it's just one line of code. This is just... But if when you start piling, then you come to the ratio that, that you mentioned, right? So how much money goes into the trash, not for proper testing, not for making the right questions and not to challenge, right? So we go into the point that people go to the moment like, why are you supposed to make a question? I will not challenge it. I know what is going to be the answer. And these conversations in, in, in board committees, in, in higher management, they're becoming more and more interesting when, when when you really talk about what affects them, which is the, the money, when you start touching the pocket and it's like, well, if you don't do that, could be that you just, or could not, just you're burning money, right? The same goes mm -hmm. when you start and say, you have to do a research. And then it's like, oh, why are you supposed to do a research? I know everything. I know exactly my company. I know what is happening. I don't need research. But then when you ask them, it's like, well, if you need to build your building for your campus, are you going to ask the architect to make a research about the area and the soil where you're going to build the tower? Yes or no? Most likely, yes. So it's the same. You're going to build a product. doesn't matter what it is. You need to do a proper research to see if your product is going to be solid for the market to make your business successful. It's the same example, right? Different costs, but still having is the same moral effect. And it's a tough conversation. And I agree, we need to be more there, inviting also some more juniors into these conversations that they understand that design also talks business, right? And we need to, to encourage them to, to understand that it's not just, just the beauty factor, right? It really has 
this this business impact and then to be able to have this eye to eye conversation and not to top to down conversation so i fully agree with 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 you Stefan. yeah um so stefan and um xavier i believe you're at quite established co uh, companies even we've not really had any formal introduction so i'm not really sure about your background um, have any of you really had experience with really, you know, entrepreneurs and starting businesses? Um, and could you answer a question on that? Yeah. Yeah. Starting your own company or? Well, so the thing is with big corporations, typically they have budgets and they already have certain uh, profits going. Um, but often what i see a lot of the transgressions happen at smaller companies of people just trying to start their business and they don't have the budget um to to perfect everything and you know i don't use dark design but from my own experience in design and focus i had to go live with an mvp and there are many areas on the platform that's i i want to improve i don't have the the resources yet. Um, and there are companies out there that, um, yeah, they the, they depend. So for design and focus, it's not my bread and butter. So it's, it's not a big deal. But for other people, it's a big deal. And so they would rather um, employ the darker designs. But also, you know, with what we discussed about the exclusivity of design uh, with only a specific privileged uh, selection of people being able, being being enabled to uh, address the issues. Um, how do we balance the field so that everybody sort of can get a slice of the cake fairly and equally without yeah, being already in a very privileged uh, position. How do we enable the least privileged people in the in the startups and the scale ups and so forth? So my experience is mostly with startups in a specific field in educational technology, and there's a lot you can do with proportional to your budget. Uh, you can talk to people even before you have anything. Uh, so this is very, it costs more time than actual money, which some startups have, depending on how you're set up. And um, also with paper prototypes or um, mockups of, of services, you can do a lot. Even if you talk to five people, it's a lot more than not talking to anyone. So I don't think there are many excuses in this uh, sense i think that um and there is also by the way uh, a design index of companies that i haven't followed a lot that shows that companies that have a strong design focus they do better than other companies so uh, we do know that it is important uh, to to have early on you cannot just apply it on top as a as a layer and then I think uh, from what I have seen in this very specific sector, so I cannot speak overall, is that the companies that get, the startups that get in trouble are the ones that get VC funding too early and they don't start with some either angel investors or bootstrapping or so on. So then they have to show growth before they have anything. And this leads them a lot of the times, not everyone, of course, but a lot of the times it leads them to be hasty and applying all, the, all these dark patterns to trick people into subscribing so that they have metrics to show to, to VCs. So I, I would mostly attribute it in there, then going back to the conformity, the conformism bit, as opposed to they all plan to fix it later on, but then they're in another like a uh, treadmill. So they sometimes never do. Um, so th this is what I have seen from my uh, vantage point in working with 
and tech uh, startups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Abba, with Evan on that one. So there is always excuses, but there is in reality no excuse to not uh, seed experiments, testings. Like nobody in my current company asked me for that when I started. Nobody in management really understood what UX was. They said, "Yeah, you're the guys who come in and like make it look good." Like, so make it look good. And I had because it's a full stack company that I am working in. So basically, what we have is machine phased engineers, and that's the backbone of this company. So they didn't really care about a person coming in and saying doesn't work, is broken, doesn't work. So I had to package that in a in a very nice manner so that I was not kicked out of any of the rooms. And secondly, starting my own business, as as Evan said, like it it really also to bolster that up, it helps to create yourself a budget during uh, or a backbone of, of a financial budget during your years of service in another company. And then going out with like not zero projects but going out with one client that might found your basics and then you have the luxury of slowly building and not having to grow too rapidly and that helped me a bunch because after two years you then have three projects and then you have the dilemma of okay i need two more designers then you face different kind of dilemmas because then you have to be careful who you select and how to ethically raise those people and how to keep them interested in your company. Um, and accessibility, as I'm wanting to say, like any company I'm talking to is saying, yeah, it's important. And then I say, cool, what's your budget? And then they say, yeah, we have no formal budget yet. So, yeah, never do what is expected of you and always challenge them in a way that that uh, they are not affronted by you and you're not, or I am not like kind of like the, the boo man or the, the naysayer, but being like, hey, I have proposal A for you. This is like what you wanted, but look at this. This is a option B and we could go into this, 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 this. Most mm -hmm. likely they are going to pick option B and go with you on the journey of experimenting and going towards a higher revenue if you present it in a way that they see value in it. In the boardroom, it might be money. In an ethics committee, it might be inclusion of a certain amount of number of people and helping others. So that's my 50 cents on that. Yeah. Uh, the being in a I think there's two parts is this um, I agree with with fully agree with both of you and when you see so I have been in in working for myself I have been working in corporate big corporates and I have been in two big corporates here in Europe and another one in Middle East so really seeing culture crashes etc and what is the notion of design in corporate side and then to say okay how they can see a design how you have to grow yourself in a monster organization as a designer and that is you are not targeted as a, the beautifier and then the, there is value behind and then going completely to the other side and going to a it consultancy where the soul or the core of the organization has nothing to do with design and then you need to go with a machete all the time between the teeth, trying to, you know, find level by level and explaining how you can have technology, how we can talk about technology, how we can talk about business, and we're not talking about design. So why why we don't have, you know, how 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 this goes together? How in 2023 we are not we are talking still about architecture, but we don't show what we are doing. So it just doesn't go together, right? And of course, it, it, it pays your salaries and, and makes this. The question is how these big organizations can shape your soul as a designer, right? So in which moment, how you, how you are as a designer is being changed by the organization where you are. 
and when is less of you as a designer and you're more of the organization designer and then it's getting better and i think that's the point where it's like okay it's moment that i jump into my own thing because then i have as stefan said like i have my own client and then i can continue and then i can develop what i really like to do and then i have the luxury perhaps to have another client and then i can develop new designers on this on the ethics that i believe that can be good and that's uh, that's beautiful right so that's uh, the beautiful beautiful idea of, of 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 a designer so this this benef benefits of being in a big organization also and there's the other risks and this risk is that you are detaching yourself of your soul as a designer your dna and that's for me sometimes yeah it's beneficial but it can be also risky if you are fine with that then it's okay but if you are somebody who wants to challenge all the time and try to you cannot change everything so there's a moment that you need to just decide mm -hmm. yeah um okay so uh, i think uh there's there's two more questions so the one is from the audience on linkedin and actually i'm going to ask that first because i need to sort of structure my next question so uh, does ux as a field have any competition So I think it has a lot of competition and uh, no competition at all at the same time. Uh, it has a lot of competition. If you approach it under the jobs to be done framework, then uh, it does have because there are um, um, like what, what going back to the previous uh, response that there are like IT uh, agencies that do or claim to do exactly the same things that maybe a UX agency would do. Um, or uh, on the other hand, there may be like visual designers that they may claim to also do entire services or processes or or products. So there is, a, in this sense, this uh, competition. On the other hand, exactly this translation from the business needs to the user needs that we do nobody else does exactly that so i think uh, in this sense if we are able to articulate that then there is no real competition so it's i don't want to get into semantics this is why i'm giving this yes and no <laughs> answer but yeah i think i agree so there's like there's a certain level of competition. Oh, there is competition, right? So when when you and you see it, so if if we look, unfortunately, so if you look into big IT consultancies, right? What happened in the last years? You look back, 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 and how many the big the big fishes have been acquiring design agencies, right? Or design consultancies, or whatever name you want to put it. But at the end entity fulfill of designers that they plug it inside their own entity which has completely different dna right and if this is happening and you can see all the names of them this is happening more and more it's just because there's a business need they will not do it because it's for free they will not do it if they're losing money they are doing it because there's a market demand and then this is plugging it inside and sometimes i could i can understand the business the business model or the business need behind, but sometimes it's really sad to see that some of these designers, talented designers, that they have been in this just design agency, when they move into these big entities, just they, they are gone, right? And, and then you see one after another one, and this is what creates a competition. There's a competition in a really fat layer, but when you go into the design eye level, right? Of course, this competition between designers, this agency, the other agency, but when we talk, and you can be from one company, me from another company, when we talk about design, there's no competition. We try to find solutions to move the things forward. We think uh, we try to think as one. And I think that's the the, the, the the differentiator. Yes, there's competition in business level. When we talk about designers between designers, it's more a healthy, healthy competition. And we, most of the times, we try to help each other. So that's how perhaps is kind of answering your your question. Um, you have an do you also want have something to add, Stefan? 
I mean, yeah. my colleagues said it all. It's the only thing I might, should I even add there? Yeah, I think so. Um, to what Javier said, they are then lost or as, as they lose their souls in, in there. It's like, why? Why do we need to lose our souls in there? We might lose, I, I am not the, the sketcher that I used to be. I am not the researcher that I used to be. So I lost a lot on the way, but I gained also a lot of ability to interpret other things and other areas and develop into other areas that I was not able to in my in my 20s. And I am for sure the weakest designer in, in product execution uh, within my team, which is good. So I have selected my team members uh, in the way of a minimum uh, standard. So I am the minimum standard in there, but, but still like uh, I'm getting more gray, I'm getting more cunning. So I know how to leverage kind of things. And that is my advantage. It's like in sports. So I wouldn't, I would less claim that it's losing your soul because I really want to think that I still have a soul. Um, but maybe like, okay, you lose some of the enthusiasm, maybe but you gain more in efficiency and you start to lose less or you start to create less friction in yourself because like in my twenties, I was a mess. I was having like three screens, two computers, like workstations and one uh, laptop. And then I was working Saturday, Sundays as well. So that was not sustainable, not maintainable. And these days I'm like, okay, now we switch off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's, um, I had a, a thought that occurred to me and it's, it's completely, it just came and it went. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that, oh uh, yeah. So um, I think what Xavier, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're talking about is sort of the other extreme. So one recent example is the Balenciaga scandal um you know the use of uh what was it it's a it's an m content for children's products and they had pedophilia material um so the one was like a dominatrix dressed or i don't know i, I don't know it's an m stuff like the fashion and the second one after they were first asked to remove that uh, they did another shoot where uh, they removed the, the very clear symbology, but they left uh, documentation of a um, court case in the U.S. Uh, surrounding pedophilia on, in, in the photo shoot. And when you zoom in, you can see that it actually refers to this case where they're trying to normalize and gain um, rights for pedophiles as, uh, you know, as, as whatever. Um, so I think there there are very extreme cases where you do sort of lose your soul when you go into that territory. I think we all know that you know if you if you sort of scam somebody out of their money, it's wrong. But to mess with people's children, that's a no-no. <laughs> so you know, addressing the wrong and addressing the no-no, that's that's quite different worlds apart. You know what I mean? And and I think that's sort of the area you're you you're referring to, Xavier. Am I wrong? It's it's more well, I think it's more extreme. You went completely more to the more more far away than where where it was many, but no, but that shows what what you mentioned, or this case it's clear that comes onto the table of any single person, doesn't matter the size of the organization, should be go out. You know, you should stand up, leave. Then do the project. That's that's the first message. That's you know, it's like doesn't matter where you are. If there's like something in this direction that doesn't feel, and it's completely against any ethical or rational whatever. I don't know what would be the terminology. Just you should not do it. You know, mm -hmm. and and this sometimes people feel pushing a certain organization that you have to do certain things because you're in this massive internal competition but you know, I was not directly going into this direction it was more like losing the the, the soul of 
sometimes this this you you adapt more yourself into into this big entity and then is should you design less about how you feel to design things and then you're shaping more into what is more the need and and sometimes that's the feeling but i also agree with Stefan. i during this journey it's just you learn a lot so while you're losing hair you're getting white hair then you're just adapting into into the needs that, that, that your body's requesting to it's it's funny i had this conversation the other day and i said you know and this is looking at myself when i was young and looking at my daughter and other young people when you're young you think you know so much and then you actually start learning and at a certain age you've acquired knowledge and skills but then young people don't listen to you anymore because you're old and boring and it's a new world so that's that in itself is another issue that i think uh, we must address uh stefan it looks like you have something to add i just wanted to add speaking of children i will leave uh and it was a perfect discussion, uh, but it's bedtime now. And uh, my son really wants to show me something before bedtime. So uh, thanks for the possibility of uh, being here, like surprising uh, possibility and hope to catch up soon again. Nice seeing you for the second time, Stefan. And uh, until next time. Until next time. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Evan. Um, so we do have another panel coming up for which I also have to prepare. So I'm going to wrap this up with um, one, one sort of visual and asking you about that. And then if you have any questions for each other or anything specifically that I overlooked, you know, playing the devil at, uh, devil's advocate yourselves, uh, I'd appreciate to hear that. So coming back to law, um, one of the major challenges that I faced when studying law and also being in an environment where I'd seen a lot of uh, corrupt judges and lawyers um, is that there, you know, law is a prestigious field and people make a lot of money in it, but without crime, there would be no industry. And, um, so so lawyers sort of depend on the crime and the wrongs and in certain cases there are influencers or sort of you know actors set in motion to to create certain turmoils and challenges that you know ensure that lawyers will always be needed but law in itself can be nuanced in that you know, slavery was lawful. So, you know, law is not an absolute truth. It's a reflection of um, what we what we make it. So with that in context, how can design, how can we eliminate, so accessibility, for example, sustainability is a, is a better example. Um, I'm not con entirely convinced about sustainability. So for me, the world is here, and if it's not, it's not. Um, we'll probably not be here to to worry about it. Uh, for me, it's always more important to address what is now happening to people and what is the the existential experience. For me, that's more important than the sustainable experience. And yet, you will get people creating horrible experiences for people so that they can push a sustainable agenda. Um, and that is very clearly we know it as greenwashing. Um, so what can we as designers do to eradicate this within our own field and maybe also to solve those issues through our own endeavors? That's a tough one. That's a <laughs> yeah, because there's like a full combination based on a lot of things that So there's a lot of philosophy, right? And there's a lot of uh, perception, and there's uh, then there's this board about ethical and not ethical. And but I think eradicate is kind of a tough and a hard word, and I think we cannot do that. Um, always will be something there that you know always will be the exception against the rule or whatever it's it's planned to do, and nothing can be eradicate if you try to or can be eradicated, but there's certain things where 
people are involved, you cannot eradicate. So um, it's 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 hard to it's it's really hard to say because it's so I'm trying to find what are the the words and then it's we cannot we can change things we can help to change the things we can educate I think that's also the important part we we have been saying all the time about changing or trying to eradicate as you mentioned how we can have an impact or uh, or the impact about sustainability or accessibility but that the only way that we can do this is by educating or how to transmit the message right so if i go and i start doing my own battlefield and i start doing my own thing and i think this is what will be super green yes will be me doing something but if i don't explain how this has to be and why this has to be then it's really hard that the next generations or the next generations of designers or the next generations of engineers or the next generations of politics or the next generation of law lawyers take this message and they contribute into this message right so and I think that's perhaps the, the, the only way to, to resume this, this into, into the sentence so some, or trying to put it because it's quite actually, I think that will make me think a lot tonight because it's quite quite a deep deep one. And now oh. it's a quick a quick. I'll answer. give a little so demo on your message. shoulder, um, yeah. Xavier. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a good one. And I think how, how you connected with the law and all the topic um there, there has to be corruption to to exist lawyers and stuff like this um i think if we take this as a as a metaphor and we try to transform it in what is the impact of a designer and it has to be things that designer can work or have an impact on it always will be things that designers has to solve so that's for me the the solution and so designers we we continue finding solutions into the problems that we have daily and if on top we can find solutions and explaining why we find the solutions with a positive impact, that again falls into the, the direction of educating and, and kind of mentoring in, into the right direction. I don't know if this is wrapping up. Yeah. I think that um, mentoring is, is a big part of it in, in practice because uh, as uh, uh, Hannah Arendt was saying, it's enough to have uh, for evil to happen it's enough to have many uh, indifferent bystanders what she mm -hmm. was calling the banality of evil which is why mm -hmm. I, I also inspired me to say that the ux is evil most people don't are not what stefan was calling psychopaths they are clearly a minority but so many people do absolutely nothing that uh, all these things that uh, Xavi said we don't have to just let the the active ones uh, do them but we also have to mentor like the the indifferent bystanders to also participate in that and make it like normalize it it has to be part of the job yeah the the sort of um uh, quote that i've heard is that uh, for uh, sometimes great evils happen because good people don't take action um and and so i think that's that's sort of a different variety so you might be indifferent and not care or you know not be affected but you can also care and just not do anything and it results to the same um so i will i will sort of give you the floor to ask uh, a couple of questions uh, by yourself we i'll give you about 10 to 15 minutes maybe maximum 20 minutes just to address the the actual issues you yourself uh you you yourselves are you know very competent in and would like to address um Evan. um I will go back. I just I'm just going to rant a bit about it. I don't have a straight question for uh, for Xavi, maybe just his experience, because I think that part of the soul crossing that I have seen in other UXers, it hasn't directly happened to me, but I've seen it a lot, is the agency or studio or consultancy that is bought up by a larger 
multinational and they are promised independence of operation and then this is not necessarily delivered i don't know i don't claim that this is a purposeful bait and switch by the companies the larger ones maybe sometimes it has happened maybe sometimes it's part of consolidating operations in and could have some legitimacy even but this is when i see most uh, uxers kind of being crushed and not being able to there's too much change uh, to be managed and i i have seen this but i would also like to to hear more about other exp the experience of other people about it mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that as well. And that's why this initiative has started. So we can even have ongoing conversations about that and check in next month to see if we had any responses. Uh, so those joining us online, uh, you can start putting your responses in the comment box. And uh, yeah, maybe I invite Avon back and maybe even also the exact same panel and we discuss this in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Uh, over to you, Xavier. I want just to, I think, answering to, to, the, to, the, to the question. Um, unfortunately, I have been seeing this also um, quite, quite a lot and I had colleagues that they have been in, in part of this transition, right? And part of being part of a studio design agency, you name it, um, and really deriving these values they had, their own DNA of working and their own patterns, and then being acquired by a bigger monster or bigger company. And then the company saying, uh, you're not going to lose your values, etc. But by time, this gets diluted, right? Because you start adapting your working model, your working process, your internal company processes, which these are sometimes not considered how, how much implication these internal processes or how much impact that has in the way that people work. Right, IT companies or business consulting companies, they have different process of working than a creative agency or a creative, everyone is creative, but I mean, design agencies. But when this, this clash sometimes, and, and when I see it, it's not considered on the board level, right? And mm -hmm. that's what has to be changed. When these discussions are happening, when there's a merchant acquisition, and that's why it's important the role of designers on that level, this has to be considered. And somebody has to raise a flag and say, this is how these guys are working. And this is how we work. And if you do this, you're going to lose 50% of the talent that you bought because you don't buy the company. You're buying the talent of the company. And, and this is where sometimes they get lost and they continue that, but the company is making such amount of tons of money. We're going to get all these accounts, but they forget that what the, the account that they have, what they are buying is a talent that, that is there. And then by not merging it, not understanding it, then they lose a the talent and guess what? They lose then the clients, right? So, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the moral effect. And, and that unfortunately is happening more and more. Uh, and just, you only need to open the media and then going back 10 years back and now, and then firms that have been driving us as the designers really in, in our studies i want to be in that firm because and then you look at it and now it's part of whatever other big uh, um uh, organization um yeah so for me question um the the, the topic ethics is i think it's, it's really really nice right and the question is how how we can bring ethics inside big organizations. So since you brought another topic of big organizations and sometimes these big organizations, they don't have the sense of ethics because they didn't learn it. And, and how we bring ethics into big organizations that they just not only provide products, but they have impact into 
public sector, into politics, into you know social organizations. So I think that's the question: how to transmit these ethics and what can be the positive, or how we convince board members about ethics in uh, in the business side. I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. That's a very crucial question, Xavier. Um, extremely crucial. I think that's one of the best questions this this whole this whole evening because it really gets to the source and you know how we 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 go out with that. Um, and I'd love to um, hear more from you and also those online on how you think we can solve these issues. So this is the final week of the Design for Tomorrow initiative for this year. Uh, initially, I, it was going to be one week, six weeks. I've already extended it. I've, already, I've, I've worked like I've never worked before the last six weeks. Um, so uh, it will be next year that we continue these conversations. And um, I would like to challenge you. Um, I'm going to be on your shoulders. I'm going to be the, the little devil and the little angel. And perhaps you can join me um, next year. So we'll be doing these panels. The plan so far is to start before the actual awareness uh, uh, initiative by doing a panel a month. And um, yeah, sort of if we can start collecting these questions uh, with specific ideas and address it, perhaps we can then reflect that in the, in the uh, initiative next year. So... For now, I would like to thank you um, for your time and for your effort. Um, Xavier, it's always a pleasure to see you. And Evan, it was great meeting you. And I think you should be a little bit more confident and understand that when people say the boring, they're just being teenage boys, the, you know, that, that, oh, you know, you're so frigid. <laughs> Um, because it's an important topic. And yeah, it, it's it's boring for people who might be challenged by it, but if you have an intellectual mind as all professionals really should, then it's a pretty exciting topic. I break on this, so it's like, it's fully, first, thank you. Um, yeah. It's always good to, to be with, uh, talking with you, but I think the topic ethics is not boring. I think people train, it, it's, it's a word that has certain bias on it and people has a, a wrong perception about what it is, but they're not aware about how interesting it is and how much is on our daily lives, right? So from politics to any product that we're using, and then also opens completely different gate about when you think about, ah, should I accept to use this application, this data, this, 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 you know, makes you think. And the question is, and it's also what we spoke through the panel, how this is transmitted into the schools, into the education, into, you know, education systems. And we have people like Ivan that is able to do it. And I think that's to, to cheer up. So nothing to be boring. I think it's a super interesting topic. Awesome. Also, thank you for the organization. Uh, it seems like incredibly a lot of work. Uh, I'm very happy that, um, ethics has been picked up uh, lately also because of uh, like uh, AI and uh, whatnot and it's easier to talk about, to talk about now than a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Indeed and for anybody really interested in ethics um, uh, Trina Falba she's been a participant like Xavier on Design in Focus and we talked about ethical design She's also founded the Ethical Design Network, um, and you can join that, uh, join the Slack group. And from that, I've met like the Trauma Informed Design Group and all of these subgroups. So you can really find a passion for topics that you're interested in. Um, Cecilia Scolaro is also joining us tomorrow, no, on Thursday, for an, a, a talk on ethics. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that we as designers can get involved in the conversation. And, you know, whenever you're facing challenges in your career, quite often it stems from an ethical dilemma. Um, that's something, you know, I think when we're eth ethically correct, then life is easier and more fair and just, and, you know, 
this, that sort of sorrows are eliminated. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a good night. Um, for those joining us next in the next episode, see you in about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm.